Pacific Northwest is that great symbol. It's so huge and grand, and, and I'm such a small person. It just blows you away. She is so big. The largest and most heavily glaciated mountain in the lower 48 states. It is something that should be revered for its cultural beauty, for its historical nature. It's almost like an ownership to people around here. Of course, it's beautiful. And that's my mountain. It's a physical challenge. It's a mental challenge. It's, uh, it challenges me climbing. There's you know, technical difficulties and, and all the dangers of mountaineering. So all these years that I've been here, it's, it's gotten into me. You know, I live at 9,500 feet for most of the summer up at Camp Sherman. And sometimes just sitting there, I look at the ridges and the glaciers, and there's a real sense that I'm part of what's happening and it's part of my life. I don't think of leaving the mountain and going home. I actually think of the mountain as my home. Still no one gives me a reason why living things have to die. Tell me how much. Is this life worth the still a mystery from death till birth? It's exciting to help someone when you pull a person up out of a crevasse and you find them alive and you can look into their eyes and you can encourage them. Um, it's a good feeling. I really feel like I'm doing valuable work. And truthfully, I've, I've fallen in crevasses too. <laughs> and I've come to learn that the mountain plane doesn't care. It just doesn't care about me or anyone else. My partner, Sean, and my housemate, Phil, were killed during a rescue. Um, they both fell. Since the accident back in 1995 with Sean and Phil, it became apparent to me that we needed you know, great climbing rangers. And I was able to recruit a number of highly skilled, um, dynamic uh, men and women that came here. And I think they really added up to the program. With all the recent rescue activity, we've done a great job. We handled them efficiently and professionally, and we were able to take care of the problems right away. You know, essentially, my friends have asked me, uh, do you resent uh, people when they get into accidents that you have to risk yourself? But I don't think of it that way, nor do I see myself as a, as a hero or anything great when I rescue these people. It's something I just do and I feel comfortable and happy to help. It was a long climb to reach the top Gonna stretch out on a big old rock Take a deep breath of mountain air Sitting in the sun, time to spare Accidents do happen, but with competent guides, over 10,000 people safely attempt to reach the top each year. I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, get a permit to guide on the Emmons side of Mount Rainier. And so for the last two years, I've conducted my guided climbing on, on the east side. People wonder if they're coming down. Yeah, those trees split off way earlier. There's a lot of uh, glacier travel on the Emmons side, so it provides for snow and ice climbers the, all the challenges that they'd find on Mount Everest. And, uh, I've climbed now for the last uh, decade on some of the world's highest peaks, including Mount Everest, where I've been six times. <coughs> Mount Rainier is, is a huge uh, part of my background and learning those skills. Oh. <laughs> Really, the only thing it lacks is the extreme altitude. I've successfully climbed Mount Rainier 262 times. 
Uh, I've had a number of really close calls, uh, in particular uh, rock fall and sometimes boulders, you know, the size of refrigerators. I've been through that a number of times and uh, <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> You know, this side has a much more expansive feel. We're much higher. We're a thousand feet higher than Paradise. Uh, we can see Mount Adams. We can uh, look to Eastern Washington. It's a different experience. Native peoples crossed all the lands, the mountains. We went to the mountainsides in the springtime and that's where we picked berries and huckleberries and we set up camp and that's where we told our stories and we played our slahel, our stick game and that's where a lot of our stories come from, the mountains and, and the legends told. And on the east side of the mountains, the Yakamas used that, that land for their stories. So it's shared amongst all the native tribes and, and groups throughout the areas. In some of our traditional stories, Mount, Mount Rainier often assumed the role of a fat, angry woman. My people, the Lemmies, cast Rainier as the jealous wife of Mount Baker, who was the favorite of Baker's two wives, but she had an awful temper. After a while, the younger wife, Mount Chexon, became the shine of Baker's eyes because she was much kinder and gentler. Furious, Mount Rainier threatened to leave unless Baker showed her more attention. When Baker ignored her, she made good of her threats and she traveled south, alone and slow. After a distance, she kept looking back, but Baker did not call her home. With a heavy heart, she continued on and camped on the night in the highest hill in the land. She stretched and stretched to see Baker and her children. And still, there was no sign he did not call her home. And often on a clear day or a clear night, the mountain dresses in sparkling white and looks longing at Baker and the mountain children near him. When the white mans came to our shore, they wanted to uh, explore the lands. So they used native guides and they asked our people to direct them up the mountain. The first recorded summit climb was led to the mountain by Sluskin, who was a Yakima native. He guided General Hazard Stevens and Philemon Van Trump. Stevens wrote that as they climbed higher on the mountain, Sluskin refused to go further. Tacoma, he said, was an enchanted mountain inhabited by an evil spirit who dwelt in a fiery lake on its summit. Many years ago, his grandfather, a great chief and warrior and a mighty hunter, had ascended partway up the mountain and had encountered some of these dangers. Um, some people believe that Native people never went past a certain point, but through our stories we know that that's not true. A Yakima Indian told this tale, Saluskin was his name. He led Governor Stevens' boys through the mountain snowy base, and it's climb up the mountain and we saw down her side. See the flowing waterfalls, her sunsets glorify. Without a doubt, the most famous guides in recorded and contemporary history of Mount Rainier are the Whitaker twins. Jim was the first American to climb Mount Everest, and Lou has led three expeditions there. The guides on Rainier are the biggest group that have summited Everest. Around 25 have done the top of Everest. When I come back, I still get goose flesh when I see the mountain. I'll fly in and see this incredible peak. This stands up higher than Mount Everest does in respect to the terrain around it. We started uh, hiking and climbing around here at the age of 12. Jim uh, guided for uh, three years on Mount Rainier, and I've guided for almost 40. He's taken blind people to the summit and uh, people with one leg. In 1981, a film crew followed Jim and Lou Whitaker as they guided the physically impaired climbers to the top. Okay, gang, you're doing it now. Right on! Uh, you get up here. 
bathroom. We'll take another 10 minutes. My leg feels like raw meat. Watch Fred on the rope now. Up rope. Falling, falling. Great, good. Hold on, hold on. Okay now. Straight back up the hill. Okay, step at a time. Okay, you're on the ridge. Hey, back to the hill. Okay? Yeah, fine. Okay, everybody, off the leg. The team continues the descent. Now the ice fall is the only real danger before them. But the glacier has been stable since the last tragedy, and the team estimates that the chance of another avalanche is very remote. The first rope team crosses safely, but precisely as the second rope team enters the path of the ice fall, the glacier cracks again. And then against all reasonable hope, before killing them all, it stops. Inexplicably, it just stops. We learn from those people how great the human spirit is, and, and uh, the mountain can help us learn that. <laughs> Lou's guide service requires a day of training before attempting the summit. We got, we got women and women guides now instead of just a bunch of macho, pseudo macho guys climbing the mountain. Okay, that's too big of a step there. Bill, right? Yeah. Okay. Bill, we're just going to take smaller ones and I lock it all the way out so my hip and my knee are locked. You know what's funny is I have almost as fun on the mountain when we don't summit. You know, because it's just about being out there with the wind and the clouds and the snow and the sun, you know. But, um, and just because people that climb are usually an incredible people. In ways, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Personally, I haven't guided enough to have like an opinion of men and women, which gender's um, tougher, but. I thought it was interesting that one of the senior guides told me that women seem to be more resilient, so interesting, yeah. The first woman to climb Rainier was a teacher and journalist, Faye Fuller. In 1890, it was a challenge just to get to the mountain. The second day of travel is long. In our saddles, 14 hours. Great tall trees line the winding trail. So straight, they seem like pillars of ancient buildings. It is then one realizes the resources of this state and the dream of its future preeminence. The next morning, riding begins for several miles over rocky riverbeds. And then the Longmire Springs come into view beneath the lofty mountain. It was in 1883 when P.B. Van Trump and James Longmire were returning from the mountain that they discovered the springs. Mr. Longmire afterward built dwellings and bathhouses and established a summer resort. We traveled higher and higher, and at the elevation of about 4,000 feet, we entered the most beautiful parks that could be created. Saturday, August 9th. 
Before starting, I donned heavy flannels, woolen hose, warm mittens and goggles, drove long cocks and brads into my shoes, rolled two single blankets containing the provisions for three days. I grasped my alpenstock and resolved to climb until exhausted. After two days of toiling upwards, at 4.30 p.m., August 10th, 1890, we stood on the top. We were somewhat sheltered in the crater and examined the steam jets, looking as if a row of boiling tea kettles had been placed along the ridge. And there, with steam beside us, we spread our blankets, took off our shoes, bathed our feet in whiskey, and began the night. Wheelmen were also challenged by Mount Rainier, and back in 1898 had a running battle for bicycle paths. Did it ever strike the local road supervisors that the old method of dumping a lot of big round boulders about the size of pumpkins into the mud holes is not the modern way of making roads? They might buy a pamphlet on modern road construction and profit thereby. And it's claim of the mountain boys and Coast down her side, see the flowing waterfalls as sunsets glorify. All right, good job. I saw you coming yeah. up. Good job. Hey, anyway, we made it. All right. Whew. Yeah, I just told my son he'd have to be mighty tired. Mighty tired. I ain't tired. I'm exhausted. Oh, yeah. That's all uphill now. All right. This is about 102 miles, according to my... 102 miles. Oh, my yeah, last. The last 20 were a killer. Yeah, <laughs> I got up here. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, oh, you did it. I don't know how I did it that either. Was a, that well, was an amazing climb. An well, amazing climb. Well, it was a little foggy. I didn't see a whole lot of mountain on the way up here. I came here with my sister and brother-in-law about 10 years ago, and I was absolutely fascinated and captivated by this mountain. Actually, at, at my desk at, at the office, I have a small postcard with a picture of Mount Rainier on it, and it, it made that much of an impression on me, and I decided I always wanted to come back. I've looked at it a couple times in the middle of a, a hectic day, thinking, boy, I'd rather be in Mount Rainier than where I am now. Maybe it's a, a, a humble feeling. You're, the, uh, the mountain is so large and beautiful, and you're so small, and it, it maybe puts things in perspective for you sort of a, a certain solitude and beauty and majesty. Perhaps the greatest challenge Rainier offers is to scientists. They're trying to predict when this active volcano will have a massive mudslide known as a lahar or a major explosion. There are 25 named glaciers on Mount Rainier. There's as much snow and ice, perennial snow and glacier ice on Mount Rainier as on all of the other Cascade volcanoes combined. So when you live downstream of that much water, uh, you have to recognize that, that, you, that there's a real hazard from flooding or from lahars that are initiated on the volcano. And I think every time I come here, I have to place the mountain in a, a different box. And I come here and, and hike and look at wildflowers, and I forget about the dangers of the volcano. Or I come here and work and look at the hazards, and I ignore the flowers. When magma intrudes in the volcano and destabilizes a slope, we could have a landslide occur, which would transform into a large mud flow. And these have occurred enough and perhaps without warning that we feel it's important to inform people, to educate them as to all the possibilities. To put it in perspective, there have been mud flows that have traveled as far as the Puget Sound lowlands and filled in large parts of Puget Sound. What concerns us most is that there are large populations at the base of the volcano 
and over 100,000 people living in areas that have been covered by lahar deposits. How likely is it that we'll have some sort of volcanic crisis here at Mount Rainier? Um, likely enough that I'm spending a portion of my career talking to people in local communities about possibilities. Mount Rainier is an active volcano. We have gases rising. There have been relatively recent eruptions as recently as the 19th century. It's not a matter of if Mount Rainier erupts, it's a matter of when. There stands a misty mountain in the soft and gentle rain Against the flight of endless time forever to remain A national park is set aside for something very unique unto itself. I think it's a great use of the taxpayers' money. Through all the passing seasons, through every night and day, I can see that misty mountain and I hear the spirit say. The mountain was there years, hundreds and hundreds of years before we even came. The vision of setting aside 330,000 acres for Mount Rainier was a great dream. In the late 1800s, a growing number of people came to realize that Mount Rainier and its surroundings must be set aside, not only for scientific research, but to preserve its outstanding scenic and recreational values for generations to come. Most important was the local support in both Tacoma and Seattle. Mountaineering clubs, newspaper editors, businessmen's associations, and the University of Washington faculty put pressure on Washington State's congressional delegation to establish a national park at Rainier. Finally, the bill passed both houses on March 2, 1899. Seattle supporters were delighted. Not so in Tacoma, as the bill finalized the name of the mountain as Rainier rather than Tacoma. To Tacomans and native peoples, it was an outrage that the great mountain was not called by its Indian name, Tacoma. Instead, in 1792, when exploring Puget Sound, Captain George Vancouver caught sight of the snowy peak and christened it Mount Rainier to honor a colleague of recent acquaintance. The founding of Rainier National Park was of great significance. For the first time in the Northwest, land was set aside for inspirational, educational, and recreational purposes, rather than to exploit its resources. During the first years of the park, roads and trails were built, facilities expanded, and approximately 500 people headed for the mountain each summer season. The completion of the railroad to Ashford in 1904 helped to make mass mountaineering outings to Rainier possible. Touring cars met the train and took groups up the mountain. In the hundred years since founding the park, it has been a constant battle to preserve its pristine natural beauty. In the early 1900s, many concessionaires were doing business, even an ice cream stand at the base of Nisqually Glacier. Bears were fed, now a definite no-no. Tent camps covered fragile meadows, another no-no. 
A nine-hole golf course was in operation for a few years. Golfers hit the ball down the mountain and returned by bus. Paradise Inn was built in 1916 by the Rainier National Park Company. Concessions were consolidated and limited to the company. But over the years, there have been dreams and schemes to expand the facilities at Paradise to a huge destination resort, a violation of the original mandate to preserve the park in its natural condition and for the inspirational quality of the landscape. Oh, the past flower has just begun to gather strength from the summer sun. And the camp robber song is always new And the petals drink from the morning dew For the past years, Mount Rainier has not only been a challenge, but has been an inspiration for photographers, poets, painters, and writers. Floyd Schmo was the first park naturalist at Rainier and wrote extensively about the mountain. Fourteen years ago, a film was made about Floyd. You can see that I don't have that sense of balance that I used to have 65 years ago when I started skiing up here. I'll be 90 in September of this year, and I suppose I'm lucky to be on my feet even. Ruth and Floyd started both their marriage and his career by snowshoeing to 5,400 feet up Rainier, where under the snow they were keepers of the inn all winter. It was here that he wrote one of his best-known books. We carried their skis up and literally tumbled down through Devil's Dip. I've left a few scars on those trees myself. Nostalgia, I don't quite know. It makes me, uh, makes me wish I had another 10, 15 years up here. Might even be my last trip. <laughs> For the almost 103 years that I have lived, Mount Rainier has become not only a magnificent place, but it has become a sacred place. There's a large sense of spirituality for a lot of people who come down to Rainier. I've talked to a number of people for whom Rainier really does symbolize the kind of physical presence of God. And you know, with, with so many religions, mountains are the place where the great leaders go up to receive wisdom. I wrote my book about Mount Rainier uh, basically to satisfy my own curiosity about the mountain. And in a way, the book is about this, um, you know, awkward bookish man going into the mountain and finding out what he can, what he can find. Um, and he finds that it's not a terribly pleasant experience most of the time. <laughs> I mean, Rainier's, Rainier's natural climate, uh, if you come down here day after day after day, most of what you'll find is this, you know, these beautiful forests. Um, but incredibly fogged in, sullen skies. Uh, this is a section about uh, my trek along the Wonderland Trail, which is the 90 mile trail that encircles the mountain. And uh, I had the bad fortune and luck to, uh, to hike it in September, which uh, is one of the rainiest times on the mountain. <laughs> it opens, the rain, the rain, the rain. If it didn't strike directly, it found me in more insidious ways. In the high meadows of Indian Henry's hunting ground, ankle-deep lupin washed my feet. The green leather of the wander shoe, my hiking boot, soaked up water with such enthusiasm that the boots earned themselves a new name, Der Water Shoe. Two days into my trek, the sweet mountain of my affection was turning nasty and cold. The mountain has scared me um, sometimes, especially when I first started going out um, on the trail alone. Mountains aren't just convenient symbols, the nearest point to heaven from earth. On days like this, they are truly spooky and epiphanic. 
The clouds, like ghosts, slip between hemlock trunks, dripping with beards of lichen. When the trees dissolve into alpine meadows and the path climbs into higher clouds, it's easy to imagine yourself approaching the gates of heaven. It would take but a moment to leap into the whiteness and become one of the people who come to Rainier and vanish. There are actually quite a few um, people for whom Mount Rainier is the final resting place. Um, there, there must be close to about 50 people still resting in the, the actual physical mountain. Um, there are 32 um, Marines who went down in an air crash in uh, 1946 and the rescuers weren't able to, to bring any of the bodies out because it was just too dangerous up that high on the glacier. A bunch of rangers and guides went up and, uh, over first in July and then they found the bodies in August. And we spent oh, a week up there trying to figure what to do with the bodies and finally left them there because they're a dangerous place to work. I think mountain rescue gives you a motivation that you don't have when you're just climbing. You'll go into an area that you wouldn't normally go climbing in just to try to save somebody. D. Molinar has written the most comprehensive book thus far on ascents, triumphs, and tragedies on Mount Rainier. I've heard all about you for years, yeah. and of course I've read, your, your read, read uh, Challenge of Rainier. You know, that book done more good for me. <laughs> I've also heard the nicest things about you for years. Huh. Um, people have really referred me. It's huh. like, you got to meet D, and I just knew we'd run across each other at some point. Yeah. Well, if you could make the opportunity at all to ever come and spend a night or two with us on the mountain, I know myself and the other climbing rangers would yeah. actually be honored, truthfully. Yeah. It'd be really, really good. Um, yeah. It's always good to connect with someone who has a real sense of some of the history in the past to kind of bring us in touch. Are you just up here for the day? or I came to deliver some maps. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'm definitely familiar with this map. Yeah. One of my last uh, things I did when I was in the park service, I decided to make a map of the park. The park service buys it for, and sells it in their museums and then gift shops. I used to do a lot of painting Usually Mount Rainier from Paradise back when I was a ranger. And you know, I usually take paints with me when I go up the trail. And uh, I, I enjoy some of the best paintings, I think, the ones I did on the spot. Whether it's a bright, clear, sunny day or kind of a cloudy, a drizzly day, a little bit of rain. And when you stand there, surrounded by this kind of a blanket of thick atmosphere, it kind of puts you in an entirely different state of mind. I think the strongest impression that I get just living here like uh, getting up in the morning and looking out and see Mount Rainier over there. And it's kind of assurance. The mountain's still there. Okay, I'm, I'm here. This assures me <laughs> that I'm in good God's hands. <laughs> I was welcomed here, clear gold of late summer, of opening autumn, the dawn eagle sunning himself on the highest tree, the mountain revealing herself unclouded, her snow-tinted apricot as she looked west, tolerant in her steadfastness of the restless sun forever rising and setting. The sun burns the snow high on the mountains it runs and it grows as it falls suit and soil down it boils down to the valleys the wide river rolls to the sea over the years rainier as an icon has been utilized by promoters and advertisers 
Concessionaires in 1920 publicized the park by romanticizing Indians. Damsels were also used as a lure, as were contented cows. Marianne Wells promoted her dance group with Rainier as a backdrop. The name and the mountain continue to be extensively adopted by image makers. Many gain their livelihood by living near the park. Mount Rainier has provided us with a job. We um, were part of the tourist trade, you know. It is a family thing. And our grandson stays with us, so he's right there too. And they always say location, location, and we are in a location where people come to us and they enjoy it. We've met people from all over the world. This $40 million resort that they propose, it's going to be devastating to our elk herd. The hunters got six elk. Uh, vehicles got 16 this year. I, I'd rather see elk than golf balls myself. When you do see Mount Rainier, it, it, it does kind of, it, it does take your breath away. Every time you see it, it's like you go, oh, the beauty. The park has created other jobs. During the depression of the 30s, the Civilian Conservation Corps created 1,000 useful conservation jobs in the park. The West and the out of doors was a new experience for many as they came from crowded eastern cities and the deep south. While the CCCs worked mainly in the summer, winter use of Mount Rainier was growing. The new sport of alpine skiing had been recently introduced to America by a flock of German and Austrian skiers who fled Hitler's Germany. Austrian Otto Lang came to Mount Rainier. I really came here to the United States with a mission. My mission was to preach the gospel propagated by Hannes Schneider how to ski in a controlled fashion and uh, at the same time be safe and secure and with a modicum of elegance. Where there's skiing, there's Otto Lahn, the foremost exponent in this country of the famed Alberg technique. And Jerome Hill, who was a very talented man in many ways, said, I would love to make a film about skiing and I would like you to be the skier in it. So we decided we'd go up to Mount Rainier and start to film there, which we did. And it so happened that the weather was absolutely incredible. There was one sunny day after the other, beautiful. And I said, my God, this is paradise. This is, this is incredible. I'm going to open a ski school here. And I was there in 1930, 1936 in the fall and opened my first ski school. The first rope though, which was installed at Mount Rainier in 1937, it was really, it was a panic. I mean, so many people fell and fell into the way of the ski skier behind them. Skiing was still in its infancy in America. And, uh, although in the Northwest, they had a comparative, they had more skiers than they had in other places. 
And one, of the, one day, a young lady showed up uh, to join the ski school, and her, her name was Gretchen Kunig. And uh, somehow, I, I sort of had a feeling that there's something about this girl that was different, and I knew that someday she would be a very good skier. Good enough that she was become a member of the U.S. ski team, and uh, her first Olympics was in St. Moritz in Switzerland. And to the surprise of everybody, she won the slalom and had enough in the downhill to get a gold medal for her slalom win and a silver medal for the combined, which was a tremendous boost for American skiing. First time that an American had won a gold medal, yes, yeah. Men or women, yeah. About the silver ski race, you, you asked me a moment ago, they had to climb from Paradise Inn up to Camp Muir, which is a good three hours climb. It's about four miles and then 4,000 feet the drop. And it's, it's a, uh, and, but the worst thing of all, the worst race, they lined up these 60 skiers entrance in one line, and at the shot of a gun or a goal, they all started out at the same time. And of course, it was mayhem. They were crisscrossing each other line, colliding, falling over each other. And it was absolutely, it was a massacre. After I left Mount Rainier, the, the, the activity during the winter sort of died down. And looking back at it now, I am so glad and so delighted that they never developed Paradise Inn as a destination winter resort. And that they didn't build a chairlift or a gondola up Mount Rainier. It would have ruined the mountain. During World War II, the very first U.S. regiment of ski troops was formed at Fort Lewis in 1940. During 1941 and 1942, the 1,000-strong 1 87th Mountain Regiment took over the lodge and trained at Paradise. They went on to become part of the 10th Mountain Infantry Division, which helped drive the Germans out of Italy. I happened to join the ski troops. I was staring out of the uh, barracks window one day, and here come these guys marching down the street with their white puttees on, with their white skis over their shoulder down the street. And being a skier and a rock climber, I thought, boy, that's the place for me. So I ran down to the captain, and uh, he said, well, Sergeant, I can transfer you. So I said, do it, and he did it. So we were scheduled to train in climbing and survival in the snow at high altitudes. And we lived in the snow all the time. We sometimes went out and stayed for maybe a week at a time. And a part of our contingent went up to the top of Mount Rainier and lived in a crater up there for about a week. But it was all just snow work and uh, learning about uh, new equipment. And they loaded it onto us on a maneuver. I had occasion to weigh my pack and it weighed 107 pounds. And ski troops were supposed to be as mobile as cavalry. And uh, no way, because you get that rucksack on you and the skis would sink down the snow. Maybe you'd see the tips of your skis all day long. When it got serious in Italy, where we went, we did a lot of fighting. We were just in it continually. And I think we spent maybe two and a half months being shot at in actual combat but it was quite heavy, and we lost uh, just under a 1,000 people. And they were talking about putting a plaque on Mount Rainier, so I volunteered to put the plaque up just above the Paradise Inn. La, 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 la,
we are practically in the mountains 90% of our lives. We start out in the winter with skiing, and then when the snow gets to be bad for skiing, we snowshoe. If it's warm and not, not good skiing, then we snowshoe. We're trying to stay healthy as long as we live. We don't know people live on medication, aspirin, high blood pressure, sugar diabetes, name it. We don't have it. The mountain helps us. The mountain is spiritual to us. It's a big, it's a high feeling. I'm 81, but it seems like the way we do it, it seems like you last longer. During the war, I was in concentration camp, and then as a patient, I came to Sweden. And there, I met my husband, and that was 52 years ago. So we go up to the mountains to Camp Milo. It's really up where you see these two rocks. It's behind the rocks over there. The mileage is, I think, 8.4 round yeah. trip. Yeah. The elevation is 10,000 feet up. And once you leave 7,200, it gets to be very difficult to breathe. Let's go. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Lately, we have only gone every other day. This year, 27 times. I've been volunteering for the Sierra Club service trips program now for about 10 years and I have a white collar job during the, the year and I, I give two weeks of my vacation time to the Sierra Club to put a trip together and bring people from across the country, all different walks of life, blue collar, white collar folks, um, to come and experience the back country. About uh, Maybe our primary job at Mount Rainier this year on our work project is to bring 16 volunteers up here and build rock retaining walls and a talus slope so that we have one trail that hikers hike on instead of hikers creating eight trails. I'm a desert rat. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I lived there for 20 years and right now in Arizona it's 110 degrees and coming up to Mount Rainier and seeing the glacier activity on the side of the mountain is incredible and actually just the greenery in the area is incredible and I'll be I'll be doing a greenery withdrawal when I go back to Phoenix and, and see all the brown and one of the the interesting things on our trail project is that we have our back to Mount Rainier most of the day and and on occasion you'll turn around and you'll see Mount Rainier and then you're like awestruck by the beauty of it and you kind of have to pinch yourself to say we're right here right in this mountain and then you go back to work <laughs> Here at Mount Rainier, we have about uh, 250 miles of maintained trail, give or take. Uh, the Wonderland Trail is a 93-mile circuit of Mount Rainier, in and out of the river valleys uh, and up into the alpine and subalpine zones. Backpacking is, is a wonderful recreation. And just getting out there alone with everything you own is on your back, um, hopefully with somebody you love, it, it's just a great experience. Thanks, thanks for trying. So do you. Yeah, no kidding. Some of the best rewards we get in this are the attaboys from people walking down the trail during the day, the, the people that are using the trail that we're working on the trail for. Yeah. Yeah, have you ever heard of the Sierra Club? Or? Oh, sure. Are you a member? No. Uh, I can't honestly say I've ever had a bad experience working with the volunteers up here. Tremendous individuals and, and uh, the groups and the leadership. Oh, they're tremendous. <laughs> These are kids from Japan. They come here every summer to work and uh, they're from Waseda University and other universities. They just absolutely love it and it's, you know, it's wet, it's hot, it's buggy and I can't believe they come back and want to work here.
they've got so many applicants because it's open not just to Waseda University but uh, most of the major universities in Japan and he has to screen like hundreds of folks and then he oh, has yeah. to pick 15 to 20 to actually come out here. Good job. Good job. Nice, I think so. nice job. And they just work like bees. They're, they're great and they have a lot of fun. Most times they're singing and talking and laughing while they're working hard and it just doesn't get any better than that. They're just, uh, I really enjoy it. Like I say, it's Christmas for me. In Tokyo, I'm working at a publishing company and I um, I, I, I'm using computer all, all the day, all day. So I think it's really good um, working in this uh, great nature and trees and flowers. So I feel really relaxed and comfortable here. Yeah, the shape of Mount Rainier is uh, similar to um, that of Mount Fuji in Japan. So I sometimes remember Mount Fuji when, I, when I'm looking at Mount Rainier. Yeah, it has uh, dignity and uh, holiness, and uh, so of course it's beautiful. So I love Mount Rainier. Everyone has to be a steward. You know, there are only, uh, there are only a few thousand national park rangers in 360 some odd areas in all states of the nation and U.S. trust territories. We can't do it alone. Gee, this is a catered event here, huh? Where does the, where does the line start? This is the Sierra Club? Um, Boy, yeah. Actually, Boeing Management Association. Oh, BMA, the Boeing Management Association. Yeah, volunteers. Yeah. They're uh, planting uh, flowers. Planting and we did, uh, Hi, uh, tried to fill in some earth on a trail. We'll head up to Edith Creek Basin in a little while. You say hello? <laughs> that was a random act of kindness. Thank you. A little reserved with strangers. He helps people. Yeah. He helps find people if they get lost. He is. Uh, trained in air and ground scenting. <laughs> Where are you headed? Of course, the younger they are, the, the more interesting some of the questions really are. Uh, excuse me, Ranger, how much does the mountain weigh? We sometimes call it uh, Stump the Ranger. People have, uh, have heard about this mountain. They'll come up and they will ask a question and they will say, well, where are the president's faces carved? And then you know, of course, they're thinking of Mount Rushmore. This roadway was built in 1916. It's narrow, with large eight, nine hundred year old western red cedar trees right on the fog line. And they will ask Ranger, how do you get the trees to grow so close to the roadway? Vehicles are a real problem for us. The Paradise parking lots hold about a thousand cars. It's been full for about five hours. And people get very short tempered. They've driven a long way and they want to park. Solutions uh, may be a shuttle service because I don't think it would be appropriate to widen the roads in the park or to build more parking lots. 97% of the park is wilderness. Yet within the next 10, 15 years, we will be surrounded by suburbia and the pressure of people to come and use the park 12 months a year. It's that pressure, pressure, pressure. In 1899, the foresight of folks from Tacoma and Seattle, in looking 100 years down the road, it is amazing to set this aside as a national park. I would hate to envision what this would look like now without such a designation. Mount Rainier represents a, a resource for everybody. I'm glad to have the opportunity just to be here. And we want to preserve the land. I wish they'd have done it with more land. Terrific mountain, real close to a major city. It's just like you have one child, you, you want to protect it. Every time I see it, it gives me a lift. It's breathtaking, the hazard potential here. I can't imagine people not being impressed by that mountain. It's a mountain that so few people really know. So I love Mount Rainier. Keep her as beautiful as she is. And it's a way to give something back. This is your park. 